That music always makes me dance a little bit. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. I am the creator of this uh, crazy mess here and uh, of uh, teaching people how to grow food online. Go figure. And when this whole thing uh, magically went down last week, uh, I said to my team, oh, my gosh, what if we did at least a garden class a day? And so that's what you're in the midst of. This is our I want to grow. I want to I want to garden.com is the website. I think that's the right one, right, Janice? I want to garden.com is the website. Please share it far and wide with your friends. Our intent here is to make sure that we get uh, as many people growing food as possible on the planet right now. So spread the word far and wide. All right, so tonight we have, um, oh, you know what, I got two more things for you real quick, at least two more things. First of all, if you want to support our work, top right button there. This is a free event. They will all be free if you would like to make a donation to support our work. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and um, also, make sure you jump into the chat box and throw us your questions. And uh, so let's get started. Mr. Murray, welcome. Good evening. Thank Excited you, to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Scott Murray is a farmer, a farmer consultant. He's been growing food for 40 years, Scott? Oh, actually 46. Yeah, there you go. Childhood, childhood work under my mom. There you go. Excellent. And he is, uh, he and I have been friends for well over a decade, and I've learned so much from Scott. He He is a master when it comes to growing food, and um, he came to me last week and he said, Greg, Victory Gardens, let's go. I said, okay, all right. What if we created a Victory Garden in every yard? So um, we're going to talk Victory Gardens and then we're going to talk gardening specific. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Mr. Murray, and let's go. Well, good evening, folks. I'm thrilled to be here. And one of my greatest challenges is the lessons from my mother when I was um, growing up, and uh, I got to help w with weeding in the garden when I was a kid, but boy, eating the food out of the garden, and then hearing the stories of my mom and as a teenager surviving with her family in Salt Lake City on a two-acre corner lot where they grew food, and they had help from members of the community who needed food, and they took care of their neighborhood. Now, today, um, in the L.A. Times, on, on the, head of the front page of the business section, they said that um, the American food supply could be interrupted if labor shortages persist. And I think that that's a warning to everyone. The second warning is that up till yesterday, they were saying this situation with the coronavirus that we have is going to be going on um, for eight months. Well, now it looks like they're saying today, one day later, up to 18 months. So here's the headline, page two. Will a labor shortage affect food supply? And I believe the answer is yes. If it does, will you be in position to grow fresh food for your family during a time of national crisis for up to 18 months? And this is the key. What are we going to do? What can we as individuals do to make a difference? Um, and one of the most important parts is how do we act ourselves? And so I'm promoting the concept of victory gardens for the year 2020. In World War II, when the United States realized they had to ship all the food to the war effort, they got um, somewhere close to 4 million Americans started gardens within a few months and they were supplying 25% of the fresh food supply for years um, because everything that the farms could produce was going to the war effort. So now I would like to, to put out what I call the Victory Garden 2020 Challenge to all of us assembled on this call around the United States and those from around the world. This economic disruption could be um, a world-changing event. And why not guarantee that you have a food supply? And the key for that is to start a garden. And what I recommend is that you assess your property for a garden location. 
some folks may only have a little tiny bit of soil, but if you have that, that's a great place to start. But I've built gardens um, for um, nonprofit organizations on asphalt parking lots and cement pads where we put down six inches of mulch, built boxes, and brought in good soil. And when the garden was growing, people couldn't even tell. But I'd, I'd pull aside the mulch in the walkways, and they would be their minds would be blown because here was this beautiful farm on top of an asphalt parking lot, which actually provided some pretty good drainage. The water would go down through the mulch and then drain off on the, the asphalt to the normal drainage. So what I'm inviting folks to do is if you have a garden, go out in your garden and start with the best soil you have in your garden. I'm showing a little picture here of a part of our annual garden that I planted a cover crop on um, right before the Thanksgiving rains that we had. This has been a very unusual for our rain, year for our rains. We had seven inches in a storm right around Thanksgiving, and then we went all the way to last week where we had another group of storms that started that have so far provided five and an eighth inches. And in between, there were four little tiny storms that sort of called themselves rain but added up to one inch. So we have to be prepared for a different type of year. And as much as possible, we can save water that rains on our roof and goes into barrels that we can use to distribute that water. But if you have a spot in your garden, and for my uh, 20, Victory Garden 2020 Challenge, what we're calling out for college students is start a four foot by eight foot garden bed. That's the first assignment. And what we're gonna do, because across the United States, we've had almost every college has sent their students home and they're working to do distance learning. And that's gonna be a great opportunity, but it's going to take time and these students are gonna get stir crazy being at home. So we're asking them, to do an extra credit project to start a garden bed, get themselves started. Now this picture shows some really nice garden beds that are made out of redwood and already have the drip irrigation line stretched out on them. And that's one of the keys, you know, how are you gonna get water to the spot that you choose? But here, the fastest thing you can do to improve your food security is start a garden to grow your own food at home. Even if you have no soil to work with and only space for a few potted plants, you can have a culinary herb garden, which will provide flavor for many meals. Or you can have a food production system. That garden space, that fits your garden space or available surface. So this afternoon, my wife and daughter got inspired by my work and went out and planted 10 five-gallon pots of lettuce and also another eight um, one gallon pots. We had the soil, we had the pots already, we amended the soil a little bit and put the seeds directly in and then covered them with some protection fabric because our ground birds here in California called towies love nothing more than to eat your new seedlings as they come up. So lay out your bed with a tape measure and stakes to kind of indicate the corners of your plot. In this case, you can see three stakes up already in my tape measure going back to measure that, that fourth corner. And I measured it both ways so I get a rough shape and then I'll be able to work within it. But once you've laid out the spot, you can dig up and turn the soil to prepare it for planting. And look around your home for all the surplus items that you can put to work planting crops. Um, any container that can hold soil and can have drainage holes can be a garden. Like we have this wonderful old wheelbarrow with a, with a flat tire and a rusted out um, bottom. And if we fill that with soil again, we can grow another crop of lettuce in it. And it looks beautiful. The neighbors are all thrilled. And I, I don't have the heart to tell them that I so far haven't been able to recycle that um, old wheelbarrow. So also you need to be focusing on how close is your water source and how will you water your crops. We need to prepare a plan to make this setup simple and easy to use. So the simplest for me is I have rain barrels that co collect the roof runoff and I use 
um, tin cans to carry that to individual plants. So here in Southern California, if we can use rainwater to extend our um, water use and reduce what we buy, the plants are much happier. So um, once you've chosen your location, if you're having the benefits here in the southern part of the United States where we have warm enough weather that um, weeds and, and cover crops are already growing, you can go right to work using the moisture from the spring rains if you've had some to um, dig all that organic matter in into your garden from the weeds or in the case of this picture I planted a, a nitrogen builder cover crop that had lots of legumes in it so that's activated the biology of the soil and got it ready for a garden um, and the next step is to um, here at the beginning of the picture I, I dug one line across the front so you can kind of see the black rich soil that I have but if you have a similar space and you have access to a store like Home Depot, the simplest soil amendment is um, composted steer manure. And that's really a good value. You can get a two cubic foot bag at a U.S. Home Depot for about $1.30. And if I had really weak soil, I'd put four bags into that four by eight area and dig, it, dig that in along with the, the weeds and other vegetation. And if I have any organic matter available in my garden, like a pile of old, slightly rotted leaves, oh my goodness, that's incredible to build the soil. And you're also going to need some tools. So if you don't have a shovel and a rake and a hose, those are the key uh, tools that you need to go forward. So this is a, 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 a commercial seed starting tray, what we call a 72 cell tray. And I have five different crops planted in that tray. Um, but you don't need to have this. Um, one of my colleagues uses old egg cartons. Um, and then once the, uh, once the eggs are out of it, they'll put soil in all the cups. They'll punch a little hole to increase the drainage. And they'll plant the seeds there. And when it's time to transplant, they'll cut the egg carton up and keep the, the paper attached because the roots will grow right through it. Um, but if you have other containers like um, disposable plastic cups, either paper or styrofoam, you can plant, poke a hole in the bottom of that and uh, put some soil in it, and that's a great place to get started. But to start seeds, you need a separate protected space, and you can create that out of some odds and ends of material you might have around your house. Um, one of my friends created a, a little mini greenhouse using um, four cinder blocks and a couple of boards to hold a piece of plastic up over the starting trays. And she would fold it back each day and water the plants. So it's very easy um, to find some way to get started on starting seeds for some of the summer crops, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, cucumbers, and the others. They take six to eight weeks to get started slowly. And they like it if they have more warmth than normal. So if you have a warm spot, like on the south side of your home facing the, the, the sun, or on the north side if you're in the southern hemisphere, that might be a protected area where you can do seedlings. Now, one of the things that we've found is that we have a lot of um, seed and seedling stealing um, animals and birds. So this particular picture shows a table in my greenhouse with two by four inch sides and another two by four box that lays on top of it. And that box has um, quarter inch mesh um, wire screening to keep the bugs, uh, well not the bugs, but to keep the birds and the mice and other rodents out of the seedlings because they're very vulnerable when they're so tiny. Um, so this table also has um, on the bottom, instead of a uh, quarter inch screen, it has window screen to which I've tied heating cables and it's sitting on an insulating panel. And if you're gonna become a, a micro farmer and really produce some food in a big yard, you might wanna look into um, some heating cables to boost your, your summer crops early. So um, when, when these seedlings um, grow up in the greenhouse to a certain stage, I move them outside into this growing box 
which has two by eight inch um, sides. So it's uh, with the box bottom, with the with the welded wire on the bottom, and the box top with the top on top. It gives the plant 16 inches to grow in their seedling trays. And when we protect our newly planted transplants from mice, birds, and other larger animals, they'll get strong enough that when they go out, they'll still need some protection, but they'll do much better. So one of the fun things is also you can um, sprout potatoes. Um, in, in my kitchen, I bring home potatoes too frequently that, that don't get used. And then my wife and daughter say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with these sprouting potatoes? But I grab these, and one of the most interesting ways to grow potatoes these days is a 15-gallon pot with a very loose soil with a lot of hay or leaves or something added to it. You put four potatoes that are starting to sprout in there. And I've seen... Uh, a video of a man knocking over one of these pots that had 60 pounds of potatoes growing in it. So what's also exciting is the potatoes will be ready to harvest in like three months. So if you have some sprouted potatoes in your kitchen, put them in the garden right away. Plant them in the compost pile or find some place to stick them where they can be for the next three to four months. So one of the things that we do here on the edge of Irvin Farm is we have these long growing beds. And these have been in use for 10 years. And um, we each year would add compost, the dark material you see on top, to the tops of the bed. And it's organic composted dairy. And we're able to rent this really nice hydraulic controlled 13 horsepower rototiller called a Barreto. And it just turns that whole bed into fluff. We rake it into shape, put the drip irrigation back out, and we're ready to plant. Sometimes we can do that all in one day uh, when we're doing a couple of beds like this. So part of it is um, on the right-hand side of that picture, you see two beds that are already planted and growing um, but have floating row cover held up on um, hoops over them so that you can um, protect that crop from uh, birds and animals, and the floating row cover will also protect it from bugs. So one of the things that we were able to build on the front of our house is a little greenhouse. Um, we used some a few pieces of new wood, some pieces of old wood, some, some old plastic. Um, I bought a, a, a screen door to make as the door for this greenhouse. And uh, it protects our sensitive crops in the winter, um, and we use it to produce our annual seedlings, um, like the ones you saw in the previous pictures, as well as some fun stuff as I'm growing coffee here in Southern California. I'm also growing pineapples. At the end of the slideshow, there's a picture of the pineapple that's almost ready to harvest. But think about how you can fashion a simple protective greenhouse with surplus materials. It doesn't even have to be as, uh, you know, four by four feet if, if you're just protecting it, your seedlings. But use a sheet of plastic, give them some protection, get them started early. Now, one of the things we use if on our farm is um, plastic mulch as a way to save water and suppress weeds because labor is always a concern. In this picture, I'm showing um, rolling out the black plastic mulch over a bed that was already prepared. The holes show, and then the drip irrigation is laid down. Once the plastic is completely sealed over the bed, then I just feel along to find the holes, open them up, and in this case, I planted this bed with um, bell peppers and then put a protection system over it and got incredible results out of uh, just a dozen plants right there. But you can see those two black lines are the drip irrigation lines that I use. If you were making a garden with very limited resources, you could water it with just a hose in the early days. But if you can get some soaker hose or other type that will help extend your the reach of your work, um, that's a very positive thing in the future. So one of the most amazing things that we need in our diet is fresh greens. And this is a picture of a bed 
of lettuce that's just approaching 60 days from seed. I grew these as transplants. You saw the nursery, then transplanted them when they were about six inches tall. And in four more weeks, they grew to be ready to harvest like this. And we do selective harvest. Sometimes we'll just harvest the big leaves off the outside. But if you do that from 10 plants, you get a huge salad and you haven't set your plants back. When they're at their, their peak, we cut those heads and, and that's finished. Um, but one of the interesting things is that for continuous cropping, you can also plant long-term crops like cut and come again, crops such as Swiss chard, kale, collards, and others. They will be just getting up to size when the lettuces are done, and then you'll have the second crop already in place, ready to go. Um, so also one of my all-time favorites and, and many people love is sweet corn. This photo shows two successions of sweet corn, which I started in the nursery just two weeks apart and then transplanted into the garden box. Um, and these days you can get very quick growing varieties that will set ears of corn in like 65 days, as early as 62 days, 65 to 75 days. But regular main season sweet corn can take 90 to 120 days. So when you're buying online your seeds, look at the days to harvest because that will give you some information about um, getting things faster. Because literally you could have corn a month or a month and a half faster by choosing faster growing seeds. So one of the things that I want to encourage everybody is to start looking for seeds for your garden. If you don't already have uh, a stash of seeds like we do in our home, um, three of my favorite seed companies in the United States, High Mowing Seed um, is up in Vermont. They have all organic seeds, which is really easy for us organic farmers um, because all their seeds are organic. The second one in Maine is Johnny's Selected Seeds. And they are an amazing company that's employee-owned and has been breeding and selling seeds for small organic farmers and small market gardeners for the last 40 years. And they don't have all organic. They occasionally have treated seed. Uh, sometimes they have uh, non-organic, non-treated seed, and then a lot of their seed is marked organic. And another of my favorites is the Territorial Seed Company. You'll find them um, up in Washington State, um, and they have an amazing catalog of really uniquely selected varieties, and many of which um, on all three seed companies are open pollinated varieties so that you can save your own seeds for the next crop. And especially in this time of challenge, right now we may be able to get seeds. Go out and buy them if you see them in a garden center. Uh, order them online, but if things get even more serious, we're going to be counting on saving seeds, and that's a very important um, lesson that, that we'll teach you here at the Urban Farm U. So one of the other things is you can mix many crops together. So what I like to do is take the, the maturity of different crops and and blend them together so that the slower maturing crops that produce a long crop, things like Swiss chard and kale and collards, these powerhouses of nutrition, but they're slower to grow. So I plant them interplanted with lettuce, and the lettuce crop is already done in 60 days when, when these crops are just setting in for their season, but they'll produce food for another four to six months, depending upon the heat. They are cool weather crops. Um, so the key is also to order the types of vegetable and herb seeds that you like to eat. <laughs> but one of the all-stars of, of this are radishes. Get a lot of radish seeds because you can grow radishes in any little open spot in 30 days in your garden. So even if you plant your tomatoes 16 inches apart, you could plant three or four radishes in between each tomato and they'll be done and in your belly way before the tomatoes start to need the space. 
So one of the things that is really important to me is how do we include the students of America and the world right now in this challenge? Well, we've had to bring a lot of these students home. Um, almost every single college in the United States has closed in the last week and sent their students home. I'm working with one campus up in LA at Cal State Northridge, and they have they sent 40,000 students home last Friday, and they're working to get online classes going. But we're promoting a concept of offering the the 2020 um, the Victory Garden 2020 Growing Challenge, the Victory Garden Challenge. So what? are these young people going to do with their time? If we get them one hour a day as extra credit, they start a garden for their family. They're providing food security for their family. This is a group of fifth graders that I worked with. These young people were amazing gardeners. As soon as we let them get out into the garden and begin to learn some of the simple skills, they so looked forward to their garden periods that it was an amazing thing to see. So the key is we need to get everybody involved. If people are at home right now wondering what to do and how to do it, um, we can help them out by um, offering them um, a challenge. Build a garden for your family. Start growing more. Now, if those folks have a garden at home, well, that's even easier. Get out there and activate the garden you have. and. One of the things about this is activating gardens is part of carbon drawdown from the atmosphere and is, car is a big part of helping to reduce each individual's carbon footprint. So we have to think of the bigger global challenge right now, which is to draw the carbon down out of the atmosphere. So if you have a garden at home, think about tuning up your garden. What we mean by the tune-up is that you look at each of your plants, you prune them for productivity. Fruit trees, for example, love pruning to, to set good fruit. But even your landscape plants in the garden, if you prune close to the ground so that you can get access to the soil and then do some other pruning, then cultivate under them, feed them with some organic compost, other fertilizer, and then put as much mulch as possible over the soil. Um, here in California, we're recommending six inches of mulch, but that six inches of mulch will cut the water consumption of those landscape plants by up to 50%, and the fertility and the moist soil could improve their carbon drawdown by up to 50%. So that's using what you already have to make a huge impact. And the second thing is we need everybody in the world to start planting more trees. And we have to plant trees that we take care of to make sure they grow and draw down carbon. There's a very interesting program out of the Technical University of Zurich, the Carruthers Lab. They call it the um, strategic reforestation program and they're calling for the planting of a trillion new trees in this next three years so that we can set up just the area of those trees to draw down up to 80 percent of the excess carbon dioxide in our atmosphere to take us back to 1930 levels but we have to plant those trees so that we take care of them and at home and in your community, why not plant trees that will give you fruit to fill your bellies um, in season? In some parts of the country, today's not the day to start a garden. Today's the day to order the seed. We're having a blizzard on the east coast of the United States today. But spring is right around the corner. Today is actually the first day of spring, as earlier than, than many, many years. And it's time to think about if if you're you still have snow on the ground well plan where you're going to put your garden start pulling the supplies together start preparing to take advantage of the moment and start seedlings inside your house where they'll be protected and they'll get going so you'll be ready once the weather changes as for the areas of the united states where we can start planting now 
here in Southern California. We've had great rains this year, and we're really excited by that. Um, so we're using that rain to get our spring garden started. Now, the best part of all of this is the harvest. Um, harvest to thrive in these challenging times. How are we going to thrive in these challenging times? And one of them is to plant a garden. And the second is then to eat that incredible food. My wife here is holding two kohlrabis. She has a basket with different types of lettuce. On the right side of the basket, there's huge, healthy collard green leaves. And they say that one cup of chopped collard greens is equal to the calcium in one cup of milk. So this is a good food to get in your garden. Everybody should be planting collard greens because they're also a cut and come again green. So you can harvest greens from that plant every week for about three to six months, depending upon the heat. So the best part of growing your own food is this smile on my wife's face when she was taking a basket into the kitchen. And this is the, the lesson of my mother and how they weathered the Great Depression when she was a teenager. She used to tell a story about a woman with five children that lived down the street and her husband had been killed in a mining accident. And she would come over and work in the garden three days a week for at least two hours. And she'd take home a box of food and a dozen eggs and she would be able to feed her family. And she did that with a, a walk five minutes down the street. So we have to think about how we can take care of ourselves, but it's also very, very important for us to think about taking care of our neighbors and those folks who aren't capable of gardening anymore, you know, let's share food with them. We have an elderly couple in our neighborhood. He's a veteran of the, of the Korean War and they're very immobilized and they don't even, they're not even able to cook anymore. So my daughter is making them a pot of chicken soup today to help them be able to take care of themselves. And we're going to do a really safe pass off of the soup. Um, we will keep social distance. We'll protect ourselves. But while we're doing that, we can be helping our neighbors. Um, we started trading um, uh, puzzles with, with our neighbors today uh, so that if we need activities, we can have jigsaw puzzles and other things to create family time together. So remember, Today is the day to start ordering some seeds or start finding them in your community. Um, at this point in this national and international crisis, the seeds might arrive relatively fast, but three months from now, it might be very, very difficult to get the seeds you need. So act now. Get yourself seeds. If you were one of the lucky folks that came to the Great American Seed Up in Phoenix last fall, you'll already have the seeds you need to get started. But we recommend get your seeds, get those started right now. So hey, here's Scott? the picture of that pineapple. Yeah. Scott, can you go back? Of Backwards course. Backwards one. I'll show it. There you go. What is the big leafed uh, item in the basket there on the right side? Um, so um, there's three items in this picture two different colors of kohlrabi in my wife's hands. Then on the left side of the basket, there's about five types of lettuce. But the big leaves on the right are about a dozen collard leaves. And these leaves in our healthy organic garden grow about 16 inches long and 12 inches wide. And they're incredibly nutritious. They're amazing, that's for sure. Cool, thank you that we just yeah. had a question about that. No problem at all. Uh, so. I want to tell people about the pineapple. You can grow a pineapple. When you have a pineapple in your home, if you carefully cut the top off, uh, it, it curves at the top. So, so cut it off when it, at, where you can go straight across and you'll leave the core of the plant. Then you peel off the top of the pineapple. And then I set that in a jar of water and I clean it until I get all the pineapple pulp off every couple of days. It takes about a month to two months and it'll sprout roots. And this plant I planted from a sprouted top last year in a 15-gallon pot. And 
it's an impressive pineapple and there's nothing better. Now this is growing inside my greenhouse and right behind it you can see some coffee plants and I have coffee cherries on, on the plants as well. So today we're inviting you to start a victory garden to, to save your family in these challenging times. And we're setting up the Victory Garden 2020 Challenge. So we would like every American home, but every home around the world, it's necessary to start a little garden to help to feed themselves, especially in these trying times, but all the time, the very best food comes out of your own garden. So here's my name, I'm Scott Murray. Murray Farms, Inc. is our business. You can contact me at scott at victorygarden2020.com and we're working to build the website there so that we can create a, a community of people who start Victory Gardens because we'd like to have you sign on to our mapping app and put a, a, a marker on your community that started another garden in your community. We won't be identifying people's address but we will be identifying the, the community they live in and that a new garden is added to that community. And I, I'd love to see that map, like the map of the people who are currently being discovered to have this uh, COVID-19 virus. If we, if we can overwhelm this virus with a map of people across the country that are producing food to stabilize their family in these challenging times, I think it's, going to be a wonderful event and we'll come out of it in much better shape. But the key is to take action, folks. And I look forward to supporting that action. I'll be working with Greg on, on uh, presenting more parts of the, the starting your victory garden. This is just an introduction, uh, but we're looking forward to supporting people all over the nation and all over the world in stepping into growing a little bit of their food even if it's just a little pot or two on your kitchen sink where you're growing some chives or you're growing some basil, and the time you flavor a meal with that, you will just be rhapsodic. So there you go, Greg. Um, I made my introduction tonight. Awesome. You did great. Thank you so much. So we have questions for you. Um, Good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start. You used the word, and I love this term, and I want you to explain it a little bit more. Cut and come again. It's a really important term for you to know when you're gardening. So tell us about that, would you? Okay. So I'm going to go back to my example of the radish. You buy a package of radish seeds. Let's say there's 100 seeds in that packet. You're mm -hmm. going to if all of them sprout, you're going to get 100 radishes, right? You put those seeds in about an inch to two inches apart. They'll grow up. You'll harvest them. You're done. Now, if you harvest, if you have a head of lettuce, there's a little bit of cut and come again flexibility in lettuce. While that plant's growing up, if you harvest the outside leaves around the edges, if you have like a dozen plants and you take two leaves off of each plant, you don't set the plant back. It keeps growing ahead for you, but you have a salad bowl full. And you can do that for about a month and a half to two months. And you want to harvest the head before it bolts, which means go to flower. But here's the beauty of cut and come again. So cut and come again can be in herbs. An example, most of the culinary herbs are cut and come again, but basil is one of my favorites. Um, from one basil plant, I've harvested as much of, as four pounds of basil. I'll pick it really serious, maybe take off four ounces, and 10 days later it's grown out again and it's ready to be harvested again. So other examples of cut and come again that I gave today were Swiss chard. And this is a member of the beet family, but it's a leaf beet. And once it gets up to enough size, even when it's small, you can take a few leaves off like the lettuce. But once it gets to size, the plants are 16 to 24 inches tall, long stems and these incredibly healthy big leaves. And you snap two, three, four leaves off the, the largest outside ones, and the plant keeps growing. And it will do this depending upon the weather for up to six months. They do 
to shut down when the heat gets really hot in the summer. Another example is kale or collards. We talked about the collard greens in the basket. They, the, the same thing when they're little, you can harvest a few leaves. I always want to taste them. But then once they get up to size, they'll have a long stem. In the case of the collards, the stem is not that edible and charred. It really is wonderful. It's a different crop altogether. But the collard greens are one of the most healthy greens all people should grow. And what happens is you can take two to four leaves off of a mature plant each week for several months until the heat causes it to bolt, and then it'll start growing a tall, thin stalk in the middle. Oftentimes, I'll harvest that stalk um, to slow it down, but it only slows it down a little, but it's really tasty. There you go, Greg. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, Mary Beth says, where should cauliflower be started? Inside or direct sow? Um, cauliflower is a plant that does much better from be, being started as a transplant. Um, it can be field grown directly, um, but it really takes a beating when it's small, just that little tiny seedling, the wind and everything blows it, plus everybody wants to eat it. So if you're going to grow it, um, use a good you know, uh, soil for your, your potting mix, transplant them when they're about four inches tall, and then protect them. Um, and one of the things that I use to protect a lot of seedlings are half-gallon plastic jugs or one-gallon plastic jugs. I'll save them from mm -hmm. milk or juice. I cut the bottom off. I save the lid, and I'll put one right over. If I'm transplanting that um, cap, well, the cauliflower plant, I'll put one over it to protect it. I'll leave the top off. If a really cold night comes, I might put the top on, and it'll get strong enough to fill up that jar before I pull the jar off and the plants are on their own in the garden. Um, the best cauliflower comes from a plant that grows very rapidly and evenly. You don't want to create um, like a drought period for the plant by forgetting to water it or something like that. You can set back the fruiting if you do that. Uh, but a wonderful uh, fresh cauliflower is one of my favorite things to eat right off the plant. Nice. Uh, whale, I hope I'm pronouncing that, correctly, W-A-E-L, from Lebanon, the country, says, in my greenhouse, I've faced some slugs and snails eating my seedlings. I've tried cardboard to repel them, but that didn't work. Any advice for snail problems at the nursery? Um, one of the things that works for snails that, that we have anywhere in the globe is wood ash. So if oh, you have a wood fireplace, yeah. mm -hmm. or you can create a small wood fire and burn it down to ash and then you use the ash to kind of circle your plants um, and make it um, a little bit of a line that, that, that insects or bugs like a snail would have to crawl onto and over and what happens is the ash is very uh, has um, lye and other compounds from the byproducts of the combustion and, and snails and slugs have this incredible skin that that is very sensitive um, to salt. Some people, if they want to stop snails and slugs, they'll use salt, but we don't want to use salt in the garden because the plants don't like the salt. But wood ash is actually has um, a lot of phosphorus and potassium and will help to nourish the plants. But if you, you create a little protection around the plants, now in your greenhouse, whale or whale, um, you can also do intermediate protection structures, like a, a plastic water bottle with the bottom cut off, and you can put a series of seedlings inside that to protect them, um, or create a little um, growing frame out of scraps of wood and plastic that will protect them. I hope that helps. Nice. Let's see here. Um, uh, Fort Collins says, I don't know who from Fort Collins, someone from Fort, Fort Collins says, is there a reason why garden beds are usually square? Well, they're actually usually rectangle, but square-ish, <laughs> yes. Would it be okay to do them in uh, a triangle? You know, 
I, I have to shape? put a caveat. I have to put a caveat in here, Greg. My wife accuses me of being too linear, uh-huh. and I'm always trying to fit as many things together as possible. But at times, to just to prove to her that I'm not totally stuck on that, once I made her a spiral garden, uh-huh. um, I dug up a little area 16 by 20 feet and made a bed that spiraled around into a little garden in the middle where there was a bench. And I used a soaker hose on the bed, and I grew corn. So for a few weeks in the summer, the corn had grown up, and she could walk through this little maze into this little private bench and sit there and have a cup of tea. And it made her so happy. The other Mm -hmm. thing about linear is we need to fit these plants into any space you have. And if you observe in, in, out in, in, in the world, plants will be growing in the oddest little spot where a little dust settled and a seed was blown. Um, one of my favorites uh, in one of my slideshows, I show a tree growing out of the crack in the sidewalk. At my home, I have mm. a grapevine growing out of the crack between two slabs of cement. It, and it's 16 feet high. And it's got the tiniest little area of soil visible, but it has its roots under the cement patio. Crazy. So any shape you can start with and get water on will grow food. The food doesn't have any issue with where it's growing as long as it can get its roots into the soil and thrive. (laughs) One thing I like to tell people is you don't want your garden beds more than about four feet wide because you can reach two feet in. But anything wider than that, it's harder to get in and get it harvested without stepping on the soil. That and that extra reaching three feet we can do, but it strains our low back. And we should always be structuring our garden to be really fun to work in and not be dangerous to us. So many beds are actually about 36 inches and then sides make it four feet wide, and you can kneel next to it and very easily reach right into the center without stretching your your low back. So um, this is from Michelle. She wants to know if there's an official page for Victory Garden 2020 on Facebook yet. Not yet. Um, Apparently Janice is in the process of that as we speak. Um, Literally, Scott and I talked about putting together Victory Garden 2020, what, yesterday? Yep. Um, yeah, and so um, it, we're we're what ifing it and getting it created as we speak because it's we have to be in action when we're doing this stuff. Um, so well, uh, we I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that's the the most important takeaway to people are look around your home. Maybe right now all you've got you you know it's cold and blustery outside. Start a few pots inside. If you have a space for a garden, start figuring out how you're going to do it. It's going to get more and more important over the coming weeks. So now is the time to start, not when you can't get any food, any fresh food at the supermarket. And it's very interesting here in the United States where things are becoming very difficult to get. And it's funny that that food wasn't the first, but, but toilet paper. So think about how you're going to take care of yourself for two to three months with what you've got at home now. So one of the best ways is to start multiplying that food by planting seeds and and transplants and cuttings and uh, whatever you can get your hands on to produce food at home that you can eat at home without going out Mm -hmm. and having to expose yourself uh, in the community more than necessary. Yeah. Um, so this is for Teresa. Uh, we've already registered victorygarden2020.com, so um, that's already well in process. So thank you for that. Um, Chris from uh, Chris says, how deep is the garden box? Um, apparently you had a garden box there. Mm-hmm. So uh, of the various garden boxes I've shown, um, Eight inches to 12 inches is the average depth of soil in those boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, 12 inches is a little better. Eight inches, even six inches is good. If they can get their roots into the soil below the box, it, you know, even four inches can, can get them started and then they can put their big roots down deep. 
Um, but if I grow on top of a surface like a, a you know a cement patio, mm -hmm. um, we could set up a box with 12 inches of soil, and you'd never know that that there was cement under it. There you go. Until you planted a tree, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Well, and I'm, I'm uh, so one of the things that I do is I collect food waste from a local restaurant, and uh, they have um, I collect it in five gallon buckets, and I have a plethora of five gallon buckets. And I'm just gonna I said to Heidi today we need to get some uh, things planted in those five gallon buckets, so it can be that easy. And, um, and use a lot of the soil from your compost pile. Yeah. So Scott, I'm gonna have to. Uh, cut you short on your question question answers. Uh, we have a bunch of questions still here, so I want you to be really concise um, with your answers, if that's okay. Because uh, I want to see how many, of we, how many of them we The rapid session. All right, cool. Mindy from Oregon says, my potatoes get scabby in my garden. Do you know how to fix it? That could be an issue with your soil, and you need to check into your local um, co-op extension and master gardeners to find out what they do locally. A lot of times people add wood ash to help with it. Cool. Next um, question. Harathi says, please explain how to use Epsom salt and which plants benefit most out of it. It's We would never use that um, here in the desert because of it's salt, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we normally don't use Epsom salts very often in agriculture. There are some uh, uses that, that are uses for pest control that work really good. Mm -hmm. um, but some people have an absence of the chemicals and Epsom salts in their soil, and so they use them. But we're really, really careful to ever add salts to our soil. Next question. Um. Jojo says, some of the things you are showing, and I'm gonna, I've am gonna, i got something else to add to this question before you start answering. Jojo Good. said, some things you are showing are for bigger farms. Can we use those processes for smaller gardens? Um, what I've noticed with working with Scott now for 10 or 12 years is, yes, we can. So she was talking about Absolutely. The, um, the black plastic. Yep. One of the things, yeah. Just then, for example. Yeah, go ahead. You could buy a you could buy a 25 foot roll roll of black plastic and cut it into strips and use it, and it will help. It will reduce weeds. It'll save water. Yeah. Um, but on the farm, uh, especially small farm, we have to use every every tool we possibly can. So these these photos were from small farms and tiny gardens. Uh, Samantha says, "Is there anything that we can use other than plastic?" We can use a lot of things other than plastic. Um, cardboard, for example, takes about three months to decompose on the soil. Um, so uh, many times I've done plantings where we might plant tomatoes and then we'll um, make a hole in the center of a, a chunk of cardboard, um, lay it over the tomato plant and on the soil, and then throw some mulch over it. And it will help to do the same thing, but just doesn't last quite as long. It, it will break down roughly around three months. Got it. You know, I don't know why I didn't even think about that. Cardboard would be great. Oh, it works really great. It just goes away in about roughly three months. Three months, um, yeah. We also yeah. use cardboard to solarize. If you have a particular bad, weedy spot in your garden, um, consider – putting down cardboard several layers over it, and then maybe building your compost pile or something on top of it. And the weight and the lack of light will kill the, the plants that were growing under it um, and uh, improve the soil all at the same time. Nice. Karen says, it appears your beds are on a slope. Do you, how do you keep them from eroding? <laughs> That's a lot of work, Karen. Um, yeah. It's what I do show in the garden is, yes, yes, we are on, on a nice slope. Um, we've gotten already one rainstorm, seven inches, and this most recent one, five inches, and only one inch for four months in between. Um, and we have water harvesting swales all over our sloping farm. So we stop the water movement and help it penetrate and then overflow to the next level. And that goes back and forth across our garden all the way down to the creek. 
and we try to keep as much of that water on the property penetrating in to benefit us as we can. Um, we also use rain barrels to store extra water, um, but store wa storing water in the soil is a fantastic way to do it. Cool. Um, Teresa from California, uh, in Phoenix, how about growing lettuce in shade? Uh, I can actually speak to that a little bit because it does get too hot in the summertime to grow it, even in the shade, I think. Maybe some of the heat tolerant ones, Scott? Yeah, I would highly recommend. Um, from Europe, there's a group of lettuces called Batavians, and they're the most heat tolerant of the lettuces. I've had um, green romaine growing next to Batavian, and the green romaine, it, it got hot. And at six inches high, it started to flower, and the Batavian would grow to a full um, head in 100-degree weather. Um, in Phoenix, it's a little more challenging. Um, there, there are several ways, though. It's like that shady side of the house that doesn't get any direct sun, keeping it moist to keep it cool, um, and using heat-tolerant varieties. Cool. Um... Samantha says, just wondering what kind, what are the best seeds to use in egg cartons right now to start out? So I'm going to actually answer this in a different way than you might answer it, Scott. Samantha, you need to nope. find out what kind of, or you need, when to plant what there. So you need to get a planting calendar specific for your area. Um, so I'll answer it right. on the planting calendar end. Um, is What's your take on it? So I, I would say, the the, comp the the compartment in an egg carton is about an inch and a half across. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to grow a cucumber or a zucchini, something that gets really big really quick, you need a bigger container. Um, sometimes I've used uh, styrofoam coffee cups that people uh, were throwing away, and I'll, I'll wash them out, punch a couple holes in the bottom, and use that for these bigger. Like a cucumber plant can get – you know, 8 to 12 inches high in three weeks mm -hmm. once it starts growing. And then you need to plant it really quick. But in the egg cartons, you could grow lettuce, you could grow basil, you could grow tomatoes, all these things, peppers, that are a small seed that, that are kind of tender and take their time to get going. Cool. Mindy says, my dad used to roll his seed potatoes in ash when he planted them. Now I know why. And, and that's that. Like, maybe she was the questioner about the scab. Um, that is one of the tricks that people do. But there's actually two parts to it. Sometimes when we take a seed potato, um, we just plant the whole thing. But farmers would cut the seed potatoes into eyes. Um, so each individual eye will grow into a, a plant, and they dry the eyes, and then they treat the eyes with ash to prevent. Um, fungus and mold from getting a quick start in that area while the plant is getting going. Interesting. Sandy said, what are root crops? <laughs> Carrots, beets, radishes, turnips, um, uh, potatoes, rutabaga, sweet potatoes, potatoes, sweet potatoes um, uh, things like Jerusalem artichokes, salsify, Jerusalem artichokes. <laughs> There's okay. got to be anything that, anything that you harvest from the ground that you pull up out of the ground. Good question. There's no such thing as uh, bad questions here. Uh, that's how we, this is how we learn. Um, Amen. Any recommendations? That. Any recommendations for organic weed control? Well, that one of the beauties of organic farming is that we actually embrace the weeds because they show us that the soil is healthy. Healthy weeds mean mm -hmm. you have healthy soil. If your weeds are yellow and, you know, just barely surviving, don't plant your garden there. Find or improve the soil before you do. But there are a number of steps of weed control. One is cultivation. So if you cultivate, my favorite tool is called a hula hoe. It's a, a metal uh, head that's like a square metal head on a on a rod and you can shuffle it through the soil and it just takes a tiny bit of little action to to uproot those baby weeds but today because it's been raining like crazy I have weeds that are three feet tall and so first I'm going to weed whack them down and then I'm going to go over them with a rototiller to incorporate the organic matter into the soil 
Right. So in every situation, we're thinking of how we can avoid it. Something like the cardboard or the plastic as a mulch. Um, you can also use uh, craft paper. Um, it will decompose, but even faster than cardboard. Um, newspaper is often used, like many layers, 10 sheets together. That will last a certain amount of time and hold moisture in the soil, uh, starve the weeds of sunlight. And we also do a technique called solarizing. What we do there is we lay, we, we, let's say you have a lawn that you want to plant your garden on. Oh my goodness, digging that out and tearing it out is a lot of work. But if you put the compost over the grass, get it wet, and then put a piece of black plastic over it that you hold down with rocks or piles of soil or something, in two to three months, it will completely decompose all the plants, and then the soil biology, the worms in that, will mix in the fertilizer that you put in, the compost, and you uncover it. It's the most beautiful, amazing soil you can ever imagine. Nice. Um, yeah. We, uh, oh, there's a great question from Rahana. Uh, can we grow in the front yard too? I'm concerned about pollution. Well, I'm going to start by saying, and I've been saying this for years, <laughs> our entire planet is polluted. Um, we can't get away from it. Nowhere, no how, I don't believe. So uh, front yard and backyard are the same for me. And I grow a shirt ton of food in my front yard. Scott? Yeah. Well, I would say that depending upon where your front yard is, you can do some additional things. Like um, you can put up a um, – one of the things we have here in California, you can buy rolls of bamboo fencing. So that could create a windbreak that would break some of the impact of the front street. Or what you do is you put a put a strong planting in right along the street. At Greg's house, he has citrus trees right along the street, and then the garden beds start on the inside of those. So they're in a very protected environment. And you know what? It's very important for biodiversity and for the pollinators to add flowers to your garden. Right now, we're talking about food. Food is very important, but you can add flowers. They bring so much life and joy to your garden. And they can also be a buffer uh, in the front of your garden. Um, this is something even big farms create biological buffers. So go for it in the front yard. Your neighbors will all be jealous. There you go. I want to thank, there's a few people out there that have uh, made a contribution donation to our uh, project here. Thank you very much for that. Every little bit of help. So we appreciate that. I've had several questions asking about the heat and what, how do we protect our plants from the heat, especially in the desert? Oh boy. You live, literally live and grow in what we call an extreme climate. Yeah. So your timing is different. You, you plant earlier for the, the vulnerable crops. You have to get them in in January and February sometimes so that mm -hmm. before it gets really hot, they're already done. And then in the summertime, there are a lot of crops that thrive on heat. One of my all-time favorites is watermelon and sweet corn, um, but they even still need to be carefully cared for to survive the heat. Um, so timing and the type of crop, and then things like shade structures and you know growing on different sides of your house. In the wintertime, if you're facing the sun to the south, that is a really good growing area for extra warmth in the wintertime, but also um, – it collects extra heat in the summertime, you know. So we have to think about these areas of our garden. And observation is the number one tool. In the practice of permaculture, one of the things we do is observe our property, observe what goes on there, observe where the sun is, observe where the water flows, observe where you might be able to save the runoff from your roof to water three or four fruit, fruit trees before it runs off your property. Or um, not let it so run off your property. If you can, that's the best. Yeah, I'll be next week. Stay tuned during our uh, Edible uh, Backyard Summit. I'm doing a, a wickedly hard, hard, wickedly smart water harvesting class next week. So uh, pay attention <laughs> for that, too. Um, so Peter asks, uh, so with the weather in Phoenix, what do I grow before it gets too hot? 
Uh, I have two answers for you on that, Peter. First of all, for those of you in the low desert, go to plantingcalendar.org, plantingcalendar.org. On that page, you will find my planting calendar for the desert southwest. That'll tell you what to plant right now in your garden. For those of you that aren't in the southwest, you need to find a planting calendar that is for your area. So, um, you know, do put in, if you're in Minnesota, put in Minnesota planting calendar and see what you come up with. I'm sure that somebody, that you'll come up with something, even if it's from the, uh, um, even if it's USDA. from the USDA or the Cooperative Extension. Um, right. Danica says herbs and or veggies that are best for an east facing patio, in your opinion. Well, in my opinion, an east facing patio is the best place to grow food, Scott. <laughs> well, especially in your intense desert climate. Mm -hmm. um, but it, an east facing patio is, is still going to have some sunnier areas and some shadier areas. And you can kind of map those zones of your patio. And if you have soil or if you're putting pots, especially pots are good because you can move them around. If they're getting a little too much sun over there, you move them over to a little less sun. Um, and don't hesitate to try anything in your spot, you yeah. know, because if you have a potted tomato plant, for example, you can move it to the to the best sun when when you want it in the hottest sun. And when it's so hot, you can move it over into the shade, for example. And because and what we hate are when tomato plants cook on the plant. Yeah. It's really something to see. No kidding. Uh, let's see here. Um, there's still a bunch of questions here that we're trying to get through. Um, Good. Okay, here's one. Uh, this, this is from, I don't have a name on this one. How do you deal with soil fleas, really, and other pests as a result of lack of crop rotation? Well, basically, you start by adding biodiversity. If you can add organic matter to your soil that's from a different area, it will bring in soil biology that, that will start to outcompete the 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 pests in your soil that have dominated mm -hmm. um, so always the number one solution is to build the health of your soil and you're you're actually feeding an organism the soil is a living medium and it yep. loves food and it loves air and it loves water and it loves to support plants and also study soil mycorrhiza uh, soil mycorrhiza are the fungi that live in the soil and they can grow right into the roots of the plants and they share, the plants share uh, glucose from photosynthesis and the mycorrhiza, the fungal hairs, can dis di digest rocks and share minerals amazing? with the plant. Yeah. So it's like, so, wow, what I, I you want to do is start the bio life of your soil. Yeah, I talked about uh, that last night in my class, so go back and watch my class from last night. And or I have two experts on the on in the summit next week. Elaine Ingham is giving a class on soil structure uh, and microbiology, and um, Emily Rocky from Tanks Green Stuff in Tucson is giving a talk on building healthy soil and compost and like that. So definitely join us for that. Um, well, Alice, I just want to add a plug. Go ahead, please. I just want to add a plug for Elaine. I've I've heard uh, Professor Ingram speak on a number of occasions. She's one of the most brilliant people in the world about how soils work, and Amen. we're just discovering this. Amen to that. It's absolutely frightening how little we really know about yeah. what we're working with. Pardon? Allison. That's okay. You're good. Allison from Mesa says, you mentioned using any kind of container, even rusted wheelbarrow. What real harm is there in using plastic containers to grow edible plants? I've heard concerns regarding leaching of chemicals from plastic into pots, uh, plastic pots into vegetables. It, I, would, I would say that um, most plastic pots are formulated of a material to grow plants and, and food. And so they're, number one, careful about uh, leaching from that particular material. Um, if it's very much a brand-new pot, 
the, the leaching could be at its maximum. If it's been around for six months in your garden, sitting in the shed, it's going to have leached almost everything that it could. And plastic containers are something that's available. Um, I, I like to have yogurt uh, once a week. It's my special treat. And those little plastic cups make great growing cups with a couple holes punched in the oh, bottom. Yeah. So yes, they do. things that are going through your kitchen, recycle them into using immediately. Reuse them, yes, absolutely. Um, Mary from Yuma says, um, can we grow lettuce now? She's in Yuma, Arizona. Shall I use a vertical gardening hydro? So we use our tower garden to grow lettuce, but usually by about uh, May 15th, it's too hot and it goes to seed. Thoughts? Well, um, my wife spends a lot of time in Yuma doing inspections, and I think Mary's kind of running out of the season. Uh, but she could yeah. grow some baby lettuce, sized lettuce that might make it, and and she would harvest young, six inches or more. So seed yeah. really heavily. Grow it almost like a a carpet uh, in a in a bigger container, um, and then um, thin it to enjoy uh, pieces in your in your lettuce and you've already harvested most of it and you're thinning it to getting bigger and bigger and then the heat comes and you finish the harvest. Nice. Aaron says, thanks for starting this broadcast. I'm the food shed coordinator for my area and I will definitely be bringing this challenge to my community. Victor, hashtag Victory Garden 2020. Scott, I think you've started something here. Aaron, Please email me. I want to talk to you. I'm Greg at urbanfarm.org. I love this idea of a food shed coordinator. Um, yeah, I'm very familiar with food shed coordinators, and, and it's a very important position because people are re starting to realize that like a watershed, a community yeah. also has to have a food shed. Yeah. Teresa from California. I work with school gardens here in San Luis Obispo County, and we'll see if we can make Victory Gardens a homework assignment. Yeah, love that. That's our goal right there. Yep. It, it, we have we sent 2.3 million children home for at least the rest of the school year last week. Yep. And if we got every one of those kids growing – you would not believe how beautiful it is to see kids working with plants. It yeah. brings out some of the very best energies in them. And they're they're incredibly intuitive with just a little bit of support. They know what they're doing and they'll yeah. they'll take care of you. Cool. <laughs> Julianne says, is Victory Garden twenty twenty going to include Canada? Heck yes, it's gonna include Canada. She said lots of people here you will bet. be interested in joining. This is a conversation for around the world. We need to come together as a growing community Amen. and grow as much food as we can. Right away. And, <clears throat> and right. Canada is, has amazing diversity of growing climates. One of the per, people on the call today was from Vancouver area. Um, yep. uh, Victoria is, is considered the garden spot of Canada. Uh, yep. But anywhere you are in the country, you can you can grow some things inside your house as well. Culinary herbs especially are wonderful as houseplants. Oh, man, I tell people this all the time. The easiest thing to grow and the most expensive thing to buy are herbs. Yes. Yes. Funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And herbs um, are largely cut and come again, too. <laughs> exactly. You plant them and you just keep pruning them until uh, – yeah, forever. I have an oregano plant in my front yard that is easily the size of the bed of my pickup truck that I planted from a four-inch pot 15 years ago. Yep. I have, I have, I have, more. I have one, one, one rosemary plant that's six feet by six feet. Yep, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Chris wants to know uh, best type of planter box. I say anything you can grow food in. She says clay, plastic, or wood. I say everything you can grow okay. food in. Uh, well, I would I would just stop and say no treated lumber. Oh, we yes, never want to use treated lumber around food because uh, somebody earlier was asking about plastic leaching. Well, lumber is treated with one of the most poisonous chemical compounds you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And in the first six months, it will leach three feet from the wood. So wow. if the box is made out of it, it leaches from either side, and you've poisoned the whole box. Yep. So no treated lumber, 
plastic is great, cement blocks are great, any 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 wood, scraps of wood, um, just be careful if they're painted wood because some old painted wood has lead in it, which is another oh, persistent yeah. compound we want to avoid yeah. in the garden. There you go. Chris Moreno Cruz says, I totally agree on hashtag Victory Garden 2020. We will definitely uh, do this here in Manila. Oh, cool. They're starting with oh, a, 16, yes. a 15 square meter balcony and expanding from there. It says thank you. Um, Perfect. But but just just to him, you're living in a country that is a garden in and of itself. Oh, yeah. But when you go outside the cities, you see the landscapes around most people's homes. They have a whole diversity of things that provide food for them all throughout the year. And everybody can benefit from that. Greg's home in, in Phoenix, my home here. Even if you live in a northern climate where half the year you're out of business, you you could have a greenhouse and, and, and grow lettuce and things. Um, yeah. Elliot Coleman, a garden author, shows a picture of a greenhouse filled with salad greens he's harvesting and outside of it the snow is three feet deep on either side nice 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 i just want to mention here we're uh, an hour and 22 minutes into this and we still have over 200 people on the call so yay thank you for <laughs> wow. sticking around this is amazing this is amazing um mag says do you still mix the mushroom compost with any garden soil as topsoil or can you just use the mushroom compost as garden soil? I would I would just um, use it as garden soil. I have um, I have used it 100%. Um, I created a bed one time and grew society garlic in it and got the most outrageous society garlic plants I've ever had. There um, you go. Because it was such a loose a loose soil, but. Yeah. Any organic component you have will help improve other soil as well. You could put as much as 50% in, and you'll have such amazing soil using the worst soil you might have in your garden. Cool. All right, we've got 17 more questions here or so. So let's get – I want to get through Let's knock them off. Let's knock them off. Um, how do you know when soil is ready for planting? This is from RJ. How do you transition plants from indoor seedlings to outdoors without killing them? Um, yeah, there you go. Okay. So number one, you never, you're never totally done. Soil is a living dynamic thing. So um, sometimes we will mix soil components together and plant right away into them and, and let, the, let it sort of meld together while the plants are growing. Um, sometimes we don't even use soil or, or just a handful on the top of a straw bale. We'll put a handful of soil and plant a plant and water it and the, the roots will grow down into the straw. And a second part of the question, please. Oh my gosh, I can't Remind remember me of, already. Um, okay, um, so the, the other part, let's see. Oh my God, it was a memory fault there. I apologize on the second part of your question. Um, uh, so let's go to the next. Next one, next one, next one. Um, uh, so, uh, ben says a playlist. He said uh, on the chat, he said, make a playlist for kids. Playlist is a series of small classes pre-recorded that would ben, would break down for students and parents how to build and install a small four by eight victory garden for the Phoenix area. You know what, Ben? Come to Joel Karsten's class next week at our summit. He's talking about straw bale gardens. I'm actually going to be putting some straw bale gardens in here at the urban farm. They're super simple and super easy. Um, so, um, and, and I lots act, of fun to watch. Yeah. And if you go to, if you go to healthy soil hacked.com, I have a, uh, a video there. You sign up for our video series. I have a video there called Perry's Instant Garden, uh, a garden that I installed in my friend Perry's backyard that was four foot by eight foot. And um, I did it in less than a day for less than $100. Beautiful spot, too, if you yeah. can. Janice says, Next question. Janice says 25 states and eight countries represented tonight. Gotta love that. Nice. Um, Christina uh, says, how would you recommend amending fine sandy soil with lots of organic matter 
Yeah. And the bigger really pieces, distinguishing... the better. Like like leaves, um, you know, uh, deciduous leaves that fall are especially good. Mm -hmm. uh, straw, uh, mushroom compost, like the other person mentioned. Um, uh, one of the things we always want to be careful of, horse manure is a great way to amend soil, but you want to make sure the horses aren't fed Bermuda grass because mm -hmm. the seeds pass right through them and they're a hellacious weed to add to your garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, Janice says, oops, we only set the uh, webinar for 90 minutes and it expires in three minutes. Janice, I just added 15 more minutes. Um, oh. oh, Jody, Jody, this is amazing. Jody says, how do I set up a protective layer from my birds? So one of the things that I love to do, Jody, is I love to go in, I plant my garden bed, and then I put an old bed sheet over the top of it, and I water the bed sheet, leave it on for two to three weeks until the plants are popping up through the, uh, you know, popping up and holding Underneath, the bed sheet up. Then you, take it up. It, then you take it off. So that's one of my tricks. Another one of my tricks is I'll actually plant the seeds down farther. I'll put a corn seed in three or four inches. And that seems to help a lot. And they, they definitely come up. Thoughts? Well, it, it's, the key is to try new things that specifically work in your situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, well, maybe this will work, like planting deeper or planting with protection. The sheet is a wonderful thing. Um, my daughter and wife planted seeds out here today while I was getting ready for this conference. And then they put a piece of agricultural fabric, which is very much like a sheet over it to protect mm -hmm. them. Um, mm -hmm. We're using wire cages because we have squirrels and towies, which are a ground scratching bird like a oh, chicken yeah. that will just tear mm -hmm. up a seed patch. Cool. Next, next ah, question. Seed companies recommended. You had three. Um, I like Baker Creek is another good one. What were your three? Well, my my first three are high mowing seed, Johnny's selected seed, and territorial seed. But mm -hmm. there are so many different yeah. great seed companies. Seed Seeds of Italy is another one of my favorite seeds because oh, yeah. I love to grow Italian seeds. And we have Baker Creek. We have all sorts. But search on the web for organic seeds and you'll find the companies that are really thinking about the future. Yeah, exactly. And there's one down in uh, Tucson, Native Seed Search as well. Native um, Seed Search. And... Somebody says, how can we contact Scott while the web page is being built? Um, uh, it's on the screen, scott at victorygarden2020.com. That's how you, uh, you get a hold of Scott. That email is up and running. I set it up today. I registered the domain today and I set it up today. So you can get Scott at <laughs> Scott at VictoryGarden2020.com. Um, Look forward to supporting you folks in your yeah. efforts to plant. Food. Yeah, he's so Scott is so good about that. Keyhole Gardens, love them. Thought Scott. Hey, you know, a garden doesn't have to be big uh, to to be amazing. Um, like one really nice tomato plant in a keyhole garden um, could give you a lot of wonderful tomatoes. Um, mm -hmm. But look at all the different spaces. If you have a spot for a keyhole garden, you might have a spot for a little square for a couple of plants or even hanging pots along a fence or mm -hmm. on a shelf. So many things will work. Yeah. So we have a bunch of questions about uh, bugs. Um, <laughs> Uh, wood ash for slugs, uh, saw bugs eating their seedlings, aphids. Um, bugs are here, in my estimation, to help us break down plants. And often when the plants aren't healthy and when uh, they're getting toward the end of their life, that's when the bugs show up. Um, so uh, I, I know Most for definitely. aphids. Most definitely. Go ahead. But they, they also talked about some seedling bugs. So the wood ash. Um, there's a great organic slug and bait product that we can get in the United States um, called, uh, oh my God, just went out of my mind suddenly. Um, but, uh, uh -oh. uh, but so there are some organic tools. Um, Sluggo Plus is what it's called. I had to go back to my place in my brain. Sluggo What's Plus. It called? 
but especially Slogo, Slogo Plus, and it's certified as an organic. It actually uses dried apple and a type of um, uh, iron um, or an iron sulfate that's an organic oh. compound. And they, they go for the apples, but the iron um, causes their metabolism, metabolism to stop. So pests are always a part of the garden. Um, protection is one way. Um, careful observation, what we call scouting, is very important. And as Greg said, if you had 10 basil plants, the one weakest plant would be the one where the bug showed up first. Yep. And, and you would need to watch that plant and then when you see that, there are a lot of organic tools that we can use. One of my very favorites, you mentioned aphids, is a product called Safer Soap. It's yep. just a coconut oil soap. And we have Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a, a soil bacteria that will take our, our uh, chewing insects out. Um, you know, there are a lot of tools. Um, one of my favorite sources for all this is an online company called Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. Mm -hmm. They're in Nevada City, California, and their website is simple as possible. It's groworganic.com. There you go. All right. Um, uh, Chris says, what about eggshells? Eggshells um, can do several things. They, they're a great source for calcium. Uh, if you want it to be fast release, you crush it up as fine as possible. If you crush it lightly, it'll release slowly over about three years. Eggshells are also one of the things that um, some growers will 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 break their eggs in a way that they have as tall of one half as they they can. They'll uh, take the egg out, punch a little hole in the bottom, wash it out, and then they have a little planting container. And when they finally plant it in the ground, you just crush the egg as the last step so the roots grow out. Pretty cool. No kidding. I like putting um, I like putting um, eggshells, a banana, and a little bit of nitrogen in the bottom of a planting hole when I plant a tomato. Yeah. We Calcium get, uh, here, is very good here, for tomatoes. Yeah, here in the desert, um, uh, we get tomato end rot, and that's from a lack yeah. of calcium. Calcium is an extraordinarily important nutrient for almost all growing plants that yeah. people don't think of often enough. Uh, so Harathi keep your eggshells. Put them in the garden. Oh, yeah. Harathi from um, Los Angeles says, which plants need Epsom salt more than others? I, you know, I've never understood the whole Epsom salt thing, and you get one minute on this question. Well, it, it's an area where... I've been farming for 46 years. I've never taken the Epsom salts outside and put them in my garden. I always use them in the bath um, <laughs> for my go. body from gardening. Yeah. And there, but there are some places where there's a chemical imbalance in the soil that the Epsom salts can help solve. Um, and, it, and you could read up on that. It's not my specialty. There you go. Any recommend any recommendations for organic weed control that? that might help clover uh, that's maybe an oxymoron there <laughs> well um, there are some other interesting things we're doing we now have some organic pesticides for example and uh, that that are very good and safe and organically approved and we also have some organic herbicides and some of them are fascinating like one weed control is corn gluten um, yes there's also the use of vinegar. There's also the use of hot water. There's also the use of flaming. Like you take a, a little propane torch and just, just oh. heat them up a little bit, poof, they're gone. Heat them up and heat them up. Um, and then the very best is cultivate them and then throw the, the, the plant right back on the soil to enrich it as it breaks down. Nice. Um, we got three left. Uh, so three more down the stretch here. How come some vegetables get bitter? Ah, this is a very interesting part of the quality of your soil in terms of nutrients, but bitterness generally comes from what we call periods of drought, where you stress the plant. And 
cucumbers is a particular place where you can get mm. a much more bitter flavor out of them. Right. Um, if they, if you let them get really dry and wilted, the next couple of uh, harvests of fruit will often be bitter. Then once the plant gets back to growing healthy, the fruit will sweeten up. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Holy shamoles, Batman. There are still over 175 people here tonight. Thank you for sticking nice. around. This is awesome. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Abby says, I keep I keep reading mixed messages on coffee grounds. Some say that you can put them directly in the garden. Others say don't and put them in the compost pile instead. What's the right thing to do? What about tea? Oh, I wish, I, I wish there was a 100% um, answer to that. But the, the problem comes when you put too many coffee grounds in one place at one time. They, they're just still pretty potent. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of things love them. They're very nutritious. But spread them around and cultivate them in. Don't just dump a big pile on them. The same with wood ash. Um, if you dump a big pile of it, you can release too many chemicals from the ash at once, and it'll set the plant back. Um, but yeah, we, we have to be careful about the things that we put in and, and a healthy soil tends to produce healthy plants. Yeah. So this is a, a longer question. That's why I saved it for last, but we're going to shorten it up and we're going to do a whole uh, webinar on, uh, on this. For those of us in the Southwest plagued by Bermuda grass and really everybody's plagued by some kind of noxious weed, Bermuda grass, Johnson grass, nut grass, uh, they grow by stolons. That's uh, the, the they basically yep. grow by their roots. And um, uh, so, do we need to kill it before building raised bed gardens on top of it? Absolutely. If you put a raised bed garden down on top of Bermuda grass, it comes or any of the, right up through it. Yep, you <laughs> will have a very nice grass lawn within about two or three months. When, when I have Johnson grass or Bermuda grass, those two, we we mow them back to the ground put compost over them. Over the Johnson grass, I'll put five or six layers of cardboard and then black plastic over is sealed over the whole thing to solarize it. Mm. Before we cover it, we water it really heavily so there's a lot of moisture. Um, I wanted to go back to a, a quick statement about the coffee. Uh, oh, yes. One of the schools where I taught at, uh, the administrator had a tree in her office and somebody got the good idea that, that trees loved coffee. So everybody that worked in this office would pour like a quarter of a cup of coffee on this plant every single day. And one day the administrator called me in and I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm in trouble. And she goes, you have to save my plants. And I'm looking at it. And it, it was in an outer pot. And I picked the plant up and there was a foot of coffee in, in, the, plant, in, the, pot. in the pot. So I took the plant out. I repotted it, gave it some fresh soil, and and then we put it back in its outer container pot, and it got a nice little sign that, you know, uh, the, Dr. Murray says, no more coffee for this plant. We're cutting it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So There you go. It, everything so, in moderation. Every, that's Thank what you, I was folks. Using. Everything in moderation. I want to just touch on this Bermuda grass once real quick. Yes, you have to really get rid of it before you – uh, if you're going to garden, and I have multiple solutions on that. I'm going to talk about that again in, here in the next couple, three weeks. So thank you. Thank you, Scott, for showing up. Thank you, everybody, for jumping in and playing this game full out. Hashtag Victory Garden 2020 apparently has become a thing. We need to get on top of that, Scott. Um, Good. And, and thank and, you, everybody. Grow some food for yourself. There you go. And as I always like to say, farm out, and we'll catch you on the flip side tomorrow night at 6, 5 p.m. Pacific. Thank you, folks.